Hello. Our story begins inside the palace inside the capital city of Sundari. Obi-Wan Kenobi was at the feet of Darth Maul. He was brought into here for some reason, but as their interaction continued, he realized the sinister nature of this. While Obi-Wan had no belief that Maul was on Mandalore for good, he wasn't sure why he was kept alive during all this time. As he stood at the bottom of the Mandalorian throne, he realized what it was. Satine was lifted off the ground in a force choke as Maul began to spew his strength outwards. It wasn't forceful or loud, he was just quiet and brooding, which Obi-Wan found all the more pretentious. Maul suggested that Obi-Wan should join the dark side, trying to convince the Jedi Master to turn to the darkness. All of Kenobi's love sitting in the person next to Maul, but he would not break. Maul continued and continued, but Satine didn't want Obi-Wan to falter, not even for her. She knew how much the Jedi meant to him, so, with as much strength as she could, she told him not to listen to Maul. Obi-Wan had no issue standing his ground here, telling Maul that he could kill him, but he could never destroy him. A short back and forth broke between the two of them. Obi-Wan concluded trying to reason with Maul. He could see Satine from the corner of his eye. All he wanted to do was save her, but it was slipping away from him each passing second. As Obi-Wan tried reasoning, Maul broke out with a rage-filled demand for Kenobi to silence himself. Maul explained that he waited for this moment, languishing for years until he could enjoy this very second. Obi-Wan knew the truth. The light was strongest in the darkest of situations. He closed his eyes, not reacting to Maul's demands as he felt through the force. Everything slowed down. He could hear his breath slip from his mouth. His fingers twisted as he felt Maul step backwards towards the team. He knew it came next. He closed his fist quickly, and both the Mandalorians next to him lost control over the jetpacks as they shot into the sky. Obi-Wan's eyes opened as Maul and Savage turned back towards him. Kenobi launched his hands forward, focused on Maul. He was flung into the throne and out the window behind it as Satine dropped to the ground. Kenobi gave a smirk to Savage before telling Satine to move out of the way. Savage was quick to his lightsaber as Kenobi pulled his own into his hands. Savage threw himself at Kenobi, but he sidestepped him. He'd done this tussle before and he wouldn't fail this time. Kenobi blocked every strike that came his way, avoiding anything he could that could be lethal, but kicking back at Savage at every opportunity. Landing a killing blow on him would be difficult, but Obi-Wan's form would be perfect for countering Savage, considering Savage bested Plo Koon not more than a couple months beforehand. As the two duelists toiled back and forth, Kenobi ripped his blade upwards, cutting Savage's lightsaber into two, just as he had Maul's on Naboo, and throwing him back to the ground. Maul leapt up and ran towards Kenobi. Obi-Wan was moving in total synchronicity with the Force. Maul lunged forward and Obi-Wan sidestepped him, letting Maul re-engage in the fight. The two brothers teamed up against Obi-Wan again, as he let the battle play into his hands. He could see how unstable Savage was, using two halves of the same lightsaber, so Kenobi let him help him into winning this rivalry. Satine was watching from a distance, regathering her composure. Obi-Wan pulled back, slipping beneath the brothers and out the other side, as Maul and Obi-Wan clashed together. Savage thrusted his blade down. Obi-Wan used all of his strength, twisting Maul's body around and dropping backwards. Savage's lightsabers went through Maul's back, nearly hitting Obi-Wan in the chest. With his back to the ground, Kenobi used the force and flung both brothers into the air, watching them slam down onto the throne. Obi-Wan turned back towards the team with a smile, grabbing a helmet and running to her. He slapped the helmet on and they rushed to the palace. As they got close to the exit, Obi-Wan was lifted from his feet when a Death Watch member wearing blue armor kicked him into last year. Satine asked the person what they were doing, and Bo looked at her sister, taking her helmet off and asking what she meant. Satine pointed at the lightsaber Obi-Wan was holding on to. Oh, that's why. Despite the previous disconnect between sisters, Bo and her night owls escorted Satine and the Jedi Master to the docking yards, getting them to a transport and getting them off-world. Bo's hope was that Satine could do something for Mandalore, which would be bringing the Republic to aid them against the Maldalorians and the traitors who served him. Obviously, they were unaware of Maul's death, but Satine would not bring the Republic to Mandalore. She understood the political mind behind not just Palpatine, but the Republic. She didn't do it before, and she wouldn't do it now. As they departed from Mandalore, she and Obi-Wan had a good amount of time to talk. The conversation revolved around a number of things, the first being gratitude. Satine never feared that Obi-Wan would turn to the dark side, but she didn't want him to lose himself because of the potential of her death. He didn't, and she was happy that he hadn't. She expressed her adoration for him, being that now the price on her head was likely higher than ever before, though these pleasantries didn't last long. As a strong leader, she needed to figure out how she would combat the rise of the Death Watch and the criminal organizations on her home world. Satine didn't want to go to Coruscant, so she went back to her home world, a planet in the Mandalore system. Satine decided she would return to her castle so that she may prepare her strategy for combating this incursion. When she was dropped off at Kalvala, Obi-Wan stayed with her. He hadn't been to the castle in decades. It was still as remarkable as ever. Satine quickly moved from the landing platform into the palace with a million thoughts running through her mind. The strategy on the part of Maul and the bandits was clever. 
Despite her hard work over the last two decades, her lack of proper military structure made them weak, but her police force and elite guard were still Mandalorians. The only issue is that they were forced to combat the three largest pirate groups in the Outer Rim, which were the Pikes, Black Sons, and Huts. Even if she had a military structure in place, they wouldn't be able to defend against such a force. It wasn't unreasonable for her people to act the way they did, in her opinion. But she believed that if they were to try and fight these crime syndicates, then they would cost more lives to her civilians, which is something she did not want, and it was truthful. Now with the Mandalorians divided again, she was tasked with restoring order to her people for the second time. This time, it would be harder. Obi-Wan followed her around as she spoke aloud to herself, trying to properly conceive a strategy to divide and conquer. For a Mandalorian, it was easy, but for an intelligent strategy to retake Sundari, that would be difficult. However, there was a chance at successfully driving back these pirates and thugs. She went to the communication room in the palace and flicked some switches. Obi-Wan watched her, wanting to speak up, but knowing better than to break her concentration. He wouldn't dare offer the aid of the Republic again, because he knew she didn't want that. It would force Mandalore out of their neutrality, and considering Dooku had aligned himself with a Death Watch, at least according to rumor, it wouldn't be worth being a part of the Republic. Plus, she didn't trust Palpatine. His ascent and occupation of power was corrupt, which in theory sounds ironic because she was a monarch, but that was a birthright, not an elected position like the one Palpatine was grasping onto. His continued ascension of power pushed her further from the Republic. The center console in the room lit up and she walked around the table, pulling off dusty sheets and looking at the table itself, as it updated. The palaces of Sundari and Kalvala were intertwined, so she could see what was going on inside the palace of Sundari whenever she wanted, which also elicited something else, a means to expose the entire plot. However, there was something else going on inside the palace at the moment. With battle ensuing across the city, a shadow arrived under the cover of darkness. Obon saw it and he asked her to keep it there. She said she wasn't going to change it anyways, asking him if he recognized the individual. Obon shook his head, turning up the sound on the table so they could listen in. Sidious walked forward, telling Savage Brez that his master had failed him. Savage wanted to know who he was and Sidious told him that he was the Dark Lord of the Sith. This didn't really mean anything to Savage. Maul was very infrequent about mentioning his past, so the name Sidious wasn't one that was all that common to him. However, Sidious told the Zabrak warrior that if he wanted, he had an opportunity for redemption. Sidious was very big into filling his ranks with individuals in case he needed to call an audible. Unaware that Dooku had ever interacted with Savage, he believed he would make a fine enforcer in case anything went wrong elsewhere. He saw Savage as a Maul 2.0. He was strong and powerful, but without knowledge on anything else, he could be exploited. However, Savage didn't like the idea of serving another master, but Sidious wouldn't give him a chance to surrender so he better choose wisely. Savage was left in confusion, but from the hollow recording, Obi-Wan could see the lightsaber and realized that this was a Sith Lord they'd been searching for. He asked Satine if she had any vessels inside the castle, and luckily, bo had a small fighter inside the palace. Obon told Satine that he would be right back, as if she planned on going anywhere. Kenobi called out the Coruscant using the old folks' home frequency to get in touch with the Jedi Council. As he did, he rapidly informed them of the latest developments here on Mandalore, a planet he technically wasn't supposed to be on. Turns out acting like his master and his apprentice did him and the Jedi well. He told them that he believed he discovered the Sith Lord, and he needed reinforcements. The Jedi were skeptical, but they trusted Obi-Wan a lot more than they ever did Qui-Gon or Anakin. So, they sent the closest Jedi to Mandalore. The order to Obi-Wan was to not engage with Sidious. Obi-Wan had no intention of doing that. He was going to intercept him, though. Kenobi was quick to move out of the castle and into a speeder. He wouldn't risk a fight on the ground, so he hoped he could stall with a potential dogfight. Luckily for him, Savage was too distraught over the death of his brother, by his own hand to deny this offer. It was a very close decision, he was on the edge about it, but he decided against attacking Sidious. Savage didn't know how deep into this Sidious was. Dooku didn't make much of a mention of anyone other than himself, but he wasn't able to initially connect the dots back to Dooku. That was the biggest thing holding Savage back, was whether or not Sidious and Dooku were intertwined, but he couldn't remember, and he didn't know. He was so good at following Maul that when it came time for him to lead, he decided to follow again. Sidious believed it was the right choice, knowing that there could never be more than just one backup. The two escaped under the cover of an ongoing war. Satine inside her palace continued her search. She was scanning through everything she had access to which meant she was able to attain recordings of Maul talking to the syndicate leaders he brought to Mandalore, Prime Minister Almec selling his people out to serve Maul, the death of Pre Vizsla, literally everything. It helped being royalty every so often. It was proof that Maul was not just using Mandalore but the crime syndicates, and considering Satine was a very staunch advocate for peace, she knew exactly how she would take advantage of the situation. 
Obi-Wan, on the other hand, intercepted the Chancellor's personal shuttle outside of Mandalore, which was extremely weird, because if the Chancellor was a Sith Lord, then surely he'd use a different vessel, right? However, if it wasn't the Chancellor, then it was relatively a smart play to get individuals to believe it was an innocent Chancellor doing the deed of a Sith Lord. Regardless, Obi-Wan surprised the vessel, shooting at it as he sped after it. Sidious's pilot pulled away, but Obi-Wan was quick to nail the hyperdrive which kept him stuck in the Mandalore system. Kenobi was trailing the apparent Sith Lord as another vessel exited hyperspace. It was a Jedi fighter, and by the looks of it, it was Mace Windu. Kenobi tapped into the frequency to make sure Windu knew it was him, as they chased down the fighter. Mace tried asking why they were firing at the Chancellor's shuttle, and Kenobi told him he didn't have time to explain. One of their shots landed, and the shuttle cruised down towards the moon of Concordia. When the Jedi landed on the planet, they pulled both the spark plugs from their starfighters just in case the Sith tried to steal them. If the Sith was able to make a treat without their fighters, then they'd be able to reinsert them and chase. The two Jedi found the wreckage quickly and searched the area. Sidious was fuming. He had no clue that Obi-Wan was on planet, so he had no clue that he could get intercepted. Mace and Kenobi kept close to each other. Mace, under the belief that the Sith Lord was here, didn't want Obi-Wan engaging first. He didn't doubt him, but his struggles against Dooku could possibly hurt him in this contest. The two Jedi stood their ground when a hulking beast crawled out of the wreckage. It was Savage. Behind them was Sidious. The crash was rougher than anticipated. The two Jedi ignited their weapons. There wasn't any time for pleasantries, as the Sith engaged quickly. Sidious was going to use Savage as a body shield. He just wanted to escape the planet and forget all about his little revenge tour on Maul. The Jedi and Sith engaged, Mace and Sidious, as well as Kenobi and Savage. Their blades moved with speed and precision. Obi-Wan was just allowing Savage to make the same stupid mistakes he made before, while Windu pressed a heavy assault on Sidious. He wasn't going to let the Dark Lord escape. Savage pressed a heavy assault, fueling himself with rage and fury. He was so angry about the death of his brother, and the fact that Obi-Wan caused it was even more rage. By this point, Obi-Wan was a family rival. He avoided each strike, allowing Savage to position himself unfavorably, until he hit Obi-Wan's blade and launched him from his feet. Kenobi slid across the rough terrain. He looked over, his face a little scarred, but he was alright. He grabbed his weapon and launched forward. The transition from Form 3 into Form 4 caught Savage by surprise. This wasn't Obi-Wan using anger or aggression, this was him using strategy. Mace, on the other hand, was scaling a rock formation while fighting with the low ground against Sidious. It was a very disadvantageous position to be in, but the Dark Lord was using the dark side and Mace was taking advantage of that. How could he not? It left Sidious incredibly vulnerable to the assault. Mace was able to use the rock formations to launch himself up into the sky. Sidious slashed, but he missed. Mace used the force and threw a wave of power at the ground, which blasted Sidious off the rocks and down off the formation. Windu landed and looked down. He could see Obi-Wan fighting aggressively. Sidious could see Obi-Wan in a weak position, so he rose to kill the Jedi who trained Skywalker. It would be the perfect blow. Mace yelled out to Obi-Wan, and as he turned back, he saw Sidious moving towards him. Kenobi stepped back but caught himself in a bind. Savage's blade slammed him backwards again, and he struggled to steady himself. Mace launched himself off the rocks, and as he did, it all happened in slow motion. Obi-Wan lost control over his blade, and he stumbled backwards. As Sidious prepared to make the killing blow, the ground erupted in fire as a yellow starfighter sped through the atmosphere. Sidious looked back and covered his face as Obi-Wan rolled out of the way. Savage and Sidious turned back and were met by flames after they regathered themselves. Skywalker slammed into the ground with Mace right beside him. Mace looked over at Anakin, and he shrugged his shoulder with a grin. He wasn't supposed to be here, but when did that ever stop him? Sidious was displeased. He couldn't kill Anakin, but with Savage nearby, perhaps he could get a good use out of him. The Dark Lord told Savage to fight with everything he had. They moved back into the fight. Mace re-engaging Sidious and Anakin, fresh of the battle, fought Sidious. Their blades were remarkable, and Kenobi rejoined the fight. The powerful Sith warriors were able to keep them at bay for long enough to hold their own. Sidious then saw an opening. He protected himself from Mace, but he could not beat him. Not now. He thrust his blade forward, avoiding a strike from the Master of the Order, before making his way to the Mandalorian fighter that Kenobi brought here. He got to it, and as he tried to turn it on, R2 fired a torpedo and blasted the ship into pieces, sending Sidious' body out of the ship. It landed, and Anakin pulled his blade up and slammed it down onto Sidious' neck and removed his head. At the same time, Obi-Wan cut the back of Savage's knee and forced him to surrender. All the pride Anakin had in the moment was met with disgruntled looks from Obi-Wan and Mace. Then, to their dismay, they realized who Sidious was. This was outrageous. It was the Chancellor. Not only was this a horrendous discovery, but it was an outrageous realization. Considering Obi-Wan was the one who was there on Genosis when he learned that the Dark Lord of the Sith was in control of the Republic. He looked to Windu, who at the same realization looked at him. Savage was ready to fight back, but he couldn't really do that at the moment. There was a lot of emotion swelling up in the group of Jedi. 
Anakin was obviously upset that his friend was just killed by him. On the other hand, Windu was just as confused, but he was reasonably upset about Skywalker's quick action. What Anakin did could make everything more complicated, especially now that it was revealed who the Sith Lord really was. Because it was Palpatine, the Jedi needed to come up with a plan of adjusting the Republic into a new era without the Chancellor. They also couldn't reveal anything about the nature of Palpatine's death because they didn't know what happened accordingly. As the Jedi were trying to figure out how to move forward, Savage stood up, launching Obi-Wan backwards and thrusting his lightsaber back towards Obi-Wan. He was cut in the upper part of his chest, close to his shoulder, as May slashed the Zabrak warrior to the ground. Obi-Wan was obviously a bit hurt by it, but nothing too bad. The Jedi would disperse. Mace told Skywalker and Kenobi to reroute as he would bring other Jedi to the planet so they could handle the situation. Obi-Wan ended up taking Mace's starfighter back to Kalvala, while at the same time Anakin returned to his fleet which wasn't stationed too far away from here, such as Mace's. Windu would have everything maintained here on Concordia, with Jedi reinforcements inbound and the Republic soon to learn about the fate regarding the Chancellor. Obi-Wan upon his return in the Jedi Starfighter would be helped to a medical room inside Castle Kreese. Satine had some maintenance and medical droids in the castle that could be used to take care of Obi-Wan. She didn't come back home often, but it was always maintained, in case Bo ever returned to their family's home. She quickly helped Obi-Wan and let the droids take over everything from there. Satine then returned to the communication room. For the hours that Kenobi was gone, she gathered all the details she needed to hatch her revenge plot. It wasn't much of a revenge, as it was saving her people from a plot clearly designed to rip Mandalore to shreds. A Mandalore that she spent 20 years of her life trying to rebuild. She wasn't angry or upset, her resolve was always on the importance of peace, because for her, the objective was to avoid war. She just had to figure out how she would implement the key instruments of her plan. With the war going on rapidly on Mandalore, she knew that she would be unsafe to return, and while she had no issue sacrificing her life for her people, she couldn't risk her life at the moment. The information she had was integral to saving Mandalore from not just itself, but the pirates and crime lords. She was able to continue her siphoning until she found the frequency used by each of the crime lords, and instead of interacting with them on a personal basis, knowing how poorly that would go, she used one of her droids in the castle to seclude the other crime syndicates. Being that none of them likely knew that Maul was dead, she could take advantage of it in the same way that Dooku had manipulated one of her representatives' messages earlier in the war. All it took was some decent editing and a little bit of luck. Satine stayed up for several hours. It had already been a long day and night, but there was no rest when it came to her people. It brought back a lot of memories for her as well. Back of the early days after the war ended. Sundari was a dystopian landscape. There were burned down buildings and destroyed residences. The city was filled with dead people and the wreckage of a civilization. She refused to allow that same fate to beset her people again. Especially since her people had gone from civil war, torn population to the shining example of neutrality in the Clone Wars. In 20 years, she turned the ashes of civilization into a prided society. She would not let anything undo that. After she spent the entire night working on the edits and rephrasing of dialogue said by Maul, she sent everything out to the crime families and hoped for the best. Luckily for her, Maul had spoken about moving to the Outer Rim after capturing Mandalore, which the crime syndicates knew he was going to do. So, with Almec in power, it was easy for him to just expand his empire. Obviously, the syndicates knew Maul was the one in power, but Satine knew, even without proving his death, she could make it seem as if he planned on gaining power to wipe them all out. She manipulated it to make every sentiment seem as if the Pikes were the ones in on it to take out the Black Suns. That the Black Suns were in on it to take out the Huts. And while of course the Huts were meant to take out their rival in the slave trade, the Zygerians. Satine hated the idea of war. But truthfully, that Mandalorian within her came out. Sometimes it didn't. Plus, it was an extra incentive to help other people out in the galaxy. Knowing her and the role she carried, the Neutral Systems Coalition could be there to provide immediate relief to those planets after the crime syndicates were erased from existence. It was the perfect counterbalance to a galaxy divided by war and destruction. She quickly sent out the messages to the crime syndicates before turning her attention back to Mandalore. Her main goal was of course to save Mandalore, but taking the crime syndicates attention away from Sundari was the first thing she needed to do. Essentially, her next step was showing conversations between Maul and Savage about exploiting Mandalore and its warriors, as well as conversations with Maul and Almec about seizing power, though she would need help with this. She needed her sister, so she called Bo to come to the Castle Grease and meet with her as soon as possible. On the other hand, the Jedi almost blamed Mandalore for what happened to the Chancellor, but Obi-Wan thankfully was able to dissuade the Council from making it look like the death of Palpatine was done by the Mandalorians. Obi-Wan's actions saved Mandalore from being completely destroyed by the Republic War Machine. So instead, the Jedi kept it hidden. 
They had the Chancellor's vessel destroyed and removed his body, taking it back to the temple to be locked away, so it could never be accessed again. Despite how little they knew of Palpatine, they were able to take advantage of the brief period before the Republic discovered he died, to do a thorough investigation of him and the war effort. By doing so, they learned that the CIS had more than enough power to overthrow the Republic. It was a designed three-year war, and with Dooku soon to realize that his master was dead, the Jedi needed to act quickly. If they could remove the Sith from both forms of government, there was a chance for the Jedi to bring a new era of peace. However, there was an unaccounted for issue, which was Dooku. They needed to take him out, so how would they handle it? It would need to be discreet. The Jedi couldn't just act like this, it was against their code. But the truth is, the entire purpose of this operation was to save the galaxy from any more war, which left the Jedi up to a difficult decision of assassination or hoping for the best. For Yoda, this decision was very difficult. Mace knew he could defeat his former friend. All it took was for Dooku to rely on the dark side of the Force and then he would have him. On Kalevala, Bo-Katan returned home, only to be upset with her sister because Satine's boyfriend, as Bill called him in a teasing way, blew up her old starfighter, the one she used to fly around the mountains. Satine did promise a replacement, but her sentiment was towards the idea of saving Mandalore. Bo was ready for the plan, and once it was explained to her, she went for it. Obi-Wan by this point had recovered from his little injury and was with the two of them. He told Satine and Bo that while his place wasn't here on Mandalore, he could be of assistance to their recapturing of the planet if she wanted. Satine was genuinely appreciative for the offer, but truthfully, Satine didn't want him near Mandalore. It wasn't because of him, but it was because she didn't want her people to see the Jedi and assume the Republic was here to help them. They needed to be entirely neutral. But the wish to help elicited a bundle of emotions from Satine, many of which were gratitude and adoration. The fact they always found each other made their bond tighter, both of them always putting the other first in a non-consequential way. But with a kiss shared, she told Obi-Wan to return to Coruscant. She'd be here when his war was finished. That was a promise. Satine would draw out her old armor, having last worn it when she was just a teenager. It wasn't the most comfortable fit, but she would make it work. She was only wearing the armor to defend herself. As per usual, she carried her defibrillator so that she wouldn't have to kill. She used to think that she'd be a warrior duchess, but the war that took her father took that motive away from her. She returned to Mandalore under the cover of darkness. The Night Owls were outnumbered, but with a strong morale, and the Maldalorians lacking a true leader, with the Darksaber having vanished, they were far weaker despite their superior numbers. The war continued into the early hours of the morning, as Satine and the Night Owls pushed towards the city square near her palace. As they trotted along, Bo and Satine moved alongside each other. It was so warming to have each other by their sides. Being sisters again was so important, especially to Satine. When they arrived at the square, after facing little resistance along their path, the messages were played. It struck the Maldalorians the most, as they realized that all in the service of their precious Darksaber, they portrayed their Mandalorian brothers and sisters to be nothing but expendable. That's all they were to Maul, and that's all they were now. It was truly a shame, and it forced a good number of them to stop fighting. However, there were always those who wanted to be special or feel important, only to get curb stomped at the first show of resistance. Mandalore obviously wasn't just retaken in a day, and it would take several months, even years to undo the carnage done by Maul and Savage. Through the messages conveying the unity between the crime families in taking Mandalore, this way to the topic of a unified military force from ever becoming prevalent on Mandalore again. Despite the people initially outraged over the attacks, it was clear that it was a movement simply used to force the Mandalorians to turn against the team. With the plot exposed, they had no real reason to see a need for a military force, just like her. There were a couple reasons for this, the first one being that even with a standing army, the Mandalorians likely would have lost. It was three whole crime syndicates. While Mandalorians were known for their warrior ways, there is no feasible way for them to handle the combative might of three major criminal organizations at once. Secondly, most of the Mandalorians in Sindari agree with Satine's peaceful ways. She saved them from the civil war that took the lives of two million people, which might not sound like a lot, but was a third of the Mandalorian population on Mandalore. It was a catastrophic loss of life for all of them, including the loss of their former capital city. Thirdly, being that there were 20 years since the last war, the two younger generations didn't want to fight because of what they saw, or if they wanted to fight, they served the elite guard or the Mandalorian police. Or of course, if they weren't alive during the conflict when it happened, they heard horror stories from their older siblings and parents about the war and how the planet had been saved through peace. The population, just as they had before, swayed right back into her hands, supporting her loyally, though it was a tough pill for the Mandalorians loyal to the ancient ways to handle, but they would have to get over it for the time being. Uniting Mandalore was much more important than things like that. Perhaps in the future there was time. At the moment though, peace was the main objective and it was, for the most part, achieved within the coming days of Satine's return. The Outer Rim, on the other hand, turned into a slug match. 
the four largest crime syndicates engaged each other. The Zygerians were blindsided by the Hutt Cartel because they came out of nowhere and attacked them. The Civil War in the Outer Rim mirrored that of the Clone Wars. It was tense and it progressively got more and more divisive. People were choosing sides rapidly as the Outer Rim descended into chaos. Satine did feel terrible about this, but after a number of discussions with the Neutral Systems Coalition, she was able to rally support for the people once the conflict was over. This rallying bought her all the time she needed to restructure what had been lost on Mandalore. In the weeks following the death of Sidious, the Republic was becoming wary that the Chancellor had been captured by the Separatists. There were calls for an attack on Serena, but the Jedi had been eerily quiet, preparing to strike at the Count. Their plans for assassination went through and they departed for Sereno. However, not everything goes the way one plans for it. This went for both Dooku and the Jedi. Thanks to Satine's little messages, using Maul's outlandish strategy, the Outer Rim was in carnage. However, there was a silver lining to it all. The slavers were losing their grip, rebellions were growing, and despite the negativity of the war, there was a future for those struggling. Dooku was meeting with the Separatist Council of Mustafar when the Jedi assassins came for him. Had he not left more than an hour before their arrival, he would have been found. However, the Separatist Council was mixed up in the progressing pirate war. Hondo Anaka pissed off a group of warriors from the Pikes, and in an attempt to chase him, he called upon the Huts and Black Sons, telling them that the Pikes were trying to capture Mustafar. Obviously, that wouldn't matter, but the Crime Lords understood how much wealth sat on Mustafar. So they went. When the Separatist Council arrived, they were instantaneously destroyed, none of them being transported in their heavy vessels because shuttles were much easier to transport rather than breaking up fleet formations. The Republic was nowhere near Mustafar, so there was no need to believe they'd be in any danger. When Dooku arrived in his solar sailor, his vessel was smacked by one of Hondo's saucers before it jumped to hyperspace and Dooku was subsequently killed by hut scum. This left a power grab in the Separatist government, just at the same time the Republic discreetly promoted Mon Mothma into the role of Interim Chancellor. This was done with the support of her allies and the intention to stand up against the war effort. Mothma was able to make it because like Bale she had a larger popularity than Padme, but also sat very opposed to Palpatine. Mon was able to garner support and she used it to take a hold of the Republic Senate. The war did continue, but with Dooku's death coming from the exterior force in the war, the Separatist government with little oversight declared war on the crime syndicates, which opened up a wider war to take control over the CIS. It was terrible for their entire operation and it allowed the Republic to make a legitimate case for continuing the war as a means to rip apart the CIS, but instead, because of Mon, they backed off. This was in another way beneficial, because the Separatist war machine was able to pick apart the criminal organizations. Mon Mothma challenged the Separatist government to forego the war effort so that diplomacy could resume. While it was difficult to align with the Republic, without Dooku or Palpatine, it was much easier. The only loose cannon was General Grievous, but with him so preoccupied on conquest in the Outer Rim, he was an easy target. There wouldn't be a period of ceasefire, instead the war would come crashing to an end with a peace treaty and a technically illegal battle. The message of the peace treaty didn't make it out of the Taurus Accords fast enough. The battle took the lives of General Grievous and Jedi Masters Mundi and Coleman Cash. Coleman was killed in a duel with Grievous, and Mundi's flagship was detonated. The reason the treaty was on Taurus rather than Mandalore was simply because of the hostility still present on Mandalore. There wasn't war, but with destruction throughout the city and on the landing docks, the planet wasn't ready to host a peace treaty, though Satine was present when the Clone Wars officially came to an end. With the war over and the Outer Rim reeling from its own war, the Neutral Systems Coalition banded together in an alliance with the Mon Mothma-led Republic to bring peace galaxy-wide. It was a hard task to fulfill. Both wars left so much carnage behind, but because of the Neutral Systems Coalition already having a plan in action for the Outer Rim, relief efforts began immediately. With Separatist battle droids reprogrammed for guard duty and stationed in the Outer Rim, pirate rebellions became infrequent. No one wanted to fight the battle droids, but the relief effort was extremely positive and it helped reunite the flame in the Outer Rim, one that inspired people to break free from the generational oppression. Satine, on the other hand, would be able to fully reunite Mandalore, as well reunite with her sister. Though there was a question that remained, what became of their warrior ways? Satine didn't want to ostracize, she never did, but the reality is, the warrior way had destroyed their people countless times. She didn't want another version of the Death Watch or the Children of the Watch coming around. They were troublesome, and they always started something, firstly that they couldn't finish, and something that didn't need to be started to begin with. She refused to allow it to happen again, so instead, she told Bo that for those who wanted to partake in the ways of the ancestors, they may continue to practice traditions near the Great Forge. She never took away the armor of those who served during the first war, during her adolescence. She wouldn't do that here either. Instead, she decided that the best way to move forward would be letting each generation learn to grow beyond. That's what it was all about to her, growing beyond what travesty bestet their past. 
Mandalore was riddled with terrible experiences, destruction at the hands of many powers. It was time for a new era, and she believed that they would see to it that it came. She would be right for it too. Mandalore's ascension into the new era was one of pride, unlike ever seen before. To the people, despite their little incursion, they saw this as an embrace of their own destiny. Their society collectively realized what was best for them and they moved into the future, especially piloted by a younger generation. Due to the nature of what happened at the beginning of the insurgents from the crime syndicates and Maul, Satine requested for Obi-Wan to cut the Mandalore, remembering what he had told her before she was almost captured at the beginning of the Clone War. Over dinner, she asked him if it was still true. He informed her that it forever would be the truth, and as such, the word was said, prompting Kenobi to leave the Order. Due to the sequence of events, Ahsoka never was framed for the bombing that never transpired. Anakin, despite his master leaving the Order, wouldn't leave the Order behind, having become a Jedi Master and taken up Obi-Wan's seat on the High Council. Skywalker had a moment of realization after it was revealed who Sidious was. He believed he was too naive for his own good, and put himself up to the task of understanding better than he currently did. He wanted to be the best man he could be, and serving the Order helped him become that. Obi-Wan would learn upon leaving the Order that there was already an heir to the throne of Mandalore. He was a boy who was consistently named Satine's nephew, but Corky Kreese was much more than just a nephew, being that Bo was far too young to have Corky when he was born. Satine would reveal the nature of their bond, and while it would be hard to hear, both Corky and Obi-Wan would be very understanding of why it was done. The structuring of the relationship was hard, and while Corky, like every sentient, had the Force, he wasn't anywhere near what his father had. He had a midichlorian count less than 2,000, but that didn't matter to him. Obi-Wan would have a very unique experience of shedding the control of the Jedi Order to allow himself to love his new family. At first, it was a family of three, but it ended up a family of five, when Obi-Wan was 35 and Satine was 34. The name of the game would be twins, a boy and a girl. The boy would share the name of Satine's father, keeping the name in the family, Adonai Kreese, and the girl would share the name of Obi-Wan's instructor, Astrid Jin Kreese. The family would be happy, and Obi-Wan would even get to enjoy the luxuries of a life as a royal. However, his life as a royal never included him receiving the rank of Duke, but that didn't matter. For Mandalorians, it was a birthright. As far as he cared, his family was happy, and that's all that mattered. He'd enjoy the pleasantries of visits from his friends in Padme, Anakin, and Ahsoka, not to mention the showing of Rex or Cody. Satine enjoyed it as much as he did, if not more than him. Having come from a very broken family, she got to enjoy love and happiness for the first time since she was just a girl. She ruled Mandalore since she was a teenager, and she was all alone in doing so, and now she was no longer alone. Her sister was with her, and she had every person she ever loved as close as ever before. The greatest joys of life were being able to help Mandalore stand once again as strong, prideful, and safe, as well as showing Obi-Wan how to truly open himself up to giving and receiving love. And that, my friends, is our wholesome PP story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalore, Sir William, 1767, Darth Revan, Granddaddy Ben, Cullen Rooney, The, Di the Last Jedi, Apollo, Weewoo 670, Anika Stank Runner, CT7567, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Nguyen, Saints of Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Yelling Slayer 66, Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Dragon, Borders Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, the main three first names, Dark Save 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. If you want to support in other ways, go check out the Patreon. Sith Clone Wars every week, every Saturday, and animations are on there if you want to see them. Otherwise, let's talk about the story real quick. I wanted to cover, like, kind of a, a political soap opera in this, uh, very, very testamental of, like, Phantom Menace kind of vibes, but I also wanted things to just play out differently. The, the natural sequence of events happened unplanned, with Sidious dying, uh, on Concordia, but I thought the idea of having Savage and Sidious team up together was kind of cool. But also, like, having Satine, like, be the main character of this story was very important, in my opinion. To have her, like, be the leader that we we hear about in the, in the Clone Wars, but never really see, because what she did is really incredible, like, turning Mandalore from a war-torn society into the head of the Neutral Systems Coalition, which is 1,500 star systems, is really incredible. And so I wanted to show that aspect of her really taking advantage of that while also giving reasons for why Mandalore fell so fast the way it did. So anyways, hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.